Good Monday afternoon. I hope I'm ready to go, but I'm not sure. I'm well bundled up, that's for certain. You're probably wondering just how cold is it in Ron's office there. Well, I can tell you, I've got a thermometer over to the side of me. It's only 78.6. That's all. And you're saying, why are you wearing your toque, your scarf, your mitts? What's going on? You got your winter jacket on. Well, later in the show, I have to tell you about a terrible snowstorm. And I get cold just thinking about it. So I thought I better dress appropriately so that I'm ready for the blizzard. First of all, you know where this starts with. It starts with this book. Where is the rest of the body? And you know that since I started this particular book that I've had help from my good friends you can see behind me to the one side actually they're both over there Sammy Skull sitting under my uh, sort of outdoor protractor and right beside him holding on to a yellow rope is Billy Bones now this time they promised to behave and Billy has a job to do as you can see from that yellow rope and I'm sure things will all work out or if they don't they won't Anyway, what's going on today? Well, let's figure out what's happened so far. You know that back on December the 11th, not 2021, but 1928, Joel and his friends had been skating and out on the farm behind Sylvie's parents' house, and they discovered part of a body, right? My goodness. That was the severed arm that they found. And of course, since then, over the next couple of weeks, other body parts have appeared. They've ended up with another arm, a couple of legs, and then and a head. It was a bald head, but it wasn't mine. Mine's still firmly attached and even protected by my scarf. Anyway, <clears throat> also we know that Joe and Jay, uh, Jay joined the police, and so now they're constables and full-fledged now as of about the uh, oh you know, towards the end of December council voted and made it the case it was in the paper I forgot the exact date I think I remember reading it and uh, you know they Chief Petrovic is somewhat baffled he's not sure what to do uh, Dr. Whittles has examined the body parts and uh, he's been in touch with the new forensic lab in uh, Toronto and uh, they have discovered some interesting things. They discovered that those body parts didn't belong to the same people. That was the first stunner. Okay. They also found out that those body parts had been frozen for quite some time. And that they'd been dragged by dogs, wolves, and other wild animals into the places where they'd been found. So somewhere there must be, uh, I don't know, someone hoarding body parts out there somewhere? Who can tell? Right? I can't. It's my story. But you won't find out for a while. Anyway, the other big news that you didn't learn about, because I didn't read it, was that Joel and Georgie got engaged on New Year's Eve at his new apartment behind his parents' store. So they're now a thing, an item, whatever you want to call it. So what's going on now? Well, we're now up to January the 9th. And if you'll recall, Jay had come up with an idea for the chief. He said, you know, uh, we can uh, maybe find where all these parts are coming from. Well, I've got a couple of ideas. This one idea was to plot on a map where all the parts had been discovered and then draw a big circle and within that circle should be the, where they came from. They had another idea since we're all north of town, take a strip of land north of town and investigate that. So on January the 9th, Monday, January the 9th, they're discussing that in the chief's office. And I just happen to have a copy of the notes with me. So let me see what it says here. It says the Christmas and New Year season had been hectic for everyone and that Jay and Joel got their first taste of being involved in domestic disputes and breaking up disturbances and fights because of excessive alcohol. Well, 
<clears throat> the rookie constables had weathered it and learned that they could take the odd punch in the course of duty. So 9 o'clock, Monday, June the 9th, they were assembled in Chief Petrovich's office. He looked around at them and said, Aside from the odd bruise, you guys look pretty good. They're learning, sir, said Constable Herman. They're getting better at ducking at the right time, said Constable Smith. And then the three experienced policemen, that included the chief, they all chuckled. And all the rookies could do was pretend to smile. I have some exciting news for you, said the chief. <clears throat> yes, he said, uh, we're going to embark on a long journey. Well, remember, this is in the, almost in the middle of winter. And now the chief's talking about a long journey. I believe you meant to say, sir, a long, paid for, successful journey to a warmer climate, said Constable Smith, hopefully. Not exactly, the chief replied. And I shouldn't have used the word we, because really the correct word is you are about to embark on a long journey. Sounds like uh, you have a pretty exhausting job for us, sir, said Smith, said rather uh, Constable Herman. He knew the kind of things that happened. The chief got the five copies of the map that Joel, sorry, that Jay had prepared, and they started to take a look at it. And he says, okay, now, this isn't going to be easy work. He said, I've taken a careful look at what Jay prepared for us. There are 110 properties to be searched. Well, these are 110 farm properties. The four of you will set up a schedule to ensure that only one pair of you are out searching at a time because I need the other two of you in town for emergencies. So <clears throat> that's what they're about to do. They're going to embark on this search. There's just one problem. It's winter and there was another bad storm on the way which came Right? We've had some of those this year here, almost 100 years later, haven't we? And so that kind of delayed things. But on Wednesday, January the 18th, that's nine days later from the day I was just talking about, Constable Herman and Joel were going out to search for the third time. They were going out to Conrad Farm, which is only a couple of miles out of town. And uh, it's still kind of cold. Wind had died down, and there was lots of snow. According to uh, a local uh, weatherman, there had been 37 inches. 37 inches. Do you know what, how much that is in centimeters? A frightening amount, pretty much a meter, of snow. And uh, that was in the sheltered areas after the storm abated. So this, this was last weekend and into Monday, and now they're going out on Wednesday. And as he says here, everyone loves a sleigh ride, but not when it's 19, not when it's 19 below Fahrenheit, which is about 30 below centigrade. Kind of cold. So they're headed to the Con, uh, they're headed to the Conrad farm. That's uh, Constable Herman and, and, and Constable Franklin or Joel, and uh, they've set it up. They know they're going to be out there. They know they're going to be looking for things. So they get leave town and go out to the Conrad farm. And uh, they get there and uh, they talk to uh, Roger. That's Roger Conrad. Don't know whether you know him or not. He's been around town for a while. But anyway, they talk to him. And uh, he's he's kind of interested in what they're doing. And, uh, you know, they, uh, they've got to search all the properties on his, all the buildings on, uh, on the property. And they also have to search the land as well. And, of course, uh, he says, I'm glad I don't have to do that search, um, but uh, I know you do, and a large part of it is just simply, I guess, a waste of your time, but you have to do it. He said, uh, it's worse than looking for a needle in a haystack, boys. It's looking for a needle in the hay production of Canada last year. But Roger talked like that. And they laughed at his joke because they wanted to be neighborly, Right. He said, did you notice that coil of rope I've got over my shoulder? He said, it's a chain in length. This is what uh, Constable Herman is saying. A chain's worth of rope. A chain's worth of rope. 
Now, a lot of you won't know what a chain is, but it's a measurement. And this is where I've co-opted Billy in to help me a little bit, because if you look over at Billy, he's got the other end of my yellow rope here. And from me to Billy, where he's hanging on to it, Billy, put that, where he's hanging on to it, it's about six feet. Well, that certainly isn't a chain. That's about two yards. And a chain is about 22 yards. Okay? Thanks, Bill. Anyway, so a lot longer than that. That's one chain. So he's got this rope wrapped around his shoulder. That is Herman does. I'm going to take my one bit off. Okay. If it gets too cold, I'll put it back on. Anyway, <clears throat> he says, uh, we use that because... Then we'll know what part of the property we've searched. So they finished the building, they did the barn, they did the chicken coop, they did those other little outbuildings, and now they're ready to do the land. So he says, we go down to the fence post on the corner, and he said, we know, and you know, that uh, the farms around here are about 20, 20 chains wide. Okay, so that means they're about, uh, let me see, 20, a uh, chain is 66 feet. You figure it out, I'm too tired. So anyway, they're fairly wide. As a matter of fact, in the part of the country I live in, and around Perth County and so on, you'll find out that that's how big these farms are. They have a mile and a quarter along each road, which, believe it or not, was what, about 100 change? So we can have 500 acre farms. Five on one side of the block, five on the other side of the block. Okay? So they're going to do this. So why are they using this 20... But to only change on? Well, because they'll take the corner post and stretch it over and they'll walk up that part of the land because that's they can see that distance of 66 feet. They can see whether they're going to discover anything or not. Right? Nice day. Should be able to spot anything in that 66 feet. If they have any questions, they'll go over and take a peek. And then, of course, when they come back, they'll plant a little flag or something so that they go up the second strip and so on. So eventually they will have done 20 chains across the farm and they will have completed searching the farm. Okay? Anyway, Roger had that figured out. So anyway, the way the boys went. Okay? And uh, they were on the back, to the back of the farm on their fourth trip when they noticed the sky had darkened and the wind had picked up and it had started to snow. Now, if I do this correctly, it looked like this. There. Yes. Can you see me? I don't know whether you can see the tree there, but I'm just behind the tree and peeking towards you. It's a very, very bad snowstorm. It's almost impossible to see, which is now you know why I put on my toque and my coat and my gloves and my scarf. Because I tell you, being out here, it's terrible. It's a whiteout. It's a blizzard. Thank goodness I'm bundled up good. There. Oh, I just came inside. So it started to stone heavily. And it took less than two minutes for them to realize they were in trouble. They couldn't see each other. They were, you know, they had one hand guy had each end of the chain. They couldn't see each other. They weren't ready for this. They didn't expect it. They didn't know where they were exactly. They knew they were on their fourth trip, but they couldn't see where they were. They didn't know how long they were going to be out there. And because of the combination of the wind and the chill, they began to think about, are we going to survive? Now, I've been in some bad storms in my car on the highway, stopped in a ditch, and in weather like this, those thoughts go through your mind. They realized they needed some shelter. And then Peter Herman says, Constable Herman, I think it was on our second trip to the end of the farm, not far from the back, there was a small group of trees. If we can get to that group of trees, we can get some shelter. So, but well, we don't want to get separated, so they wanted each of them wanted to hold on to the rope. So they tied the rope around uh, their bodies and they 
wanted to put in what they thought was in the correct direction. They couldn't see. They were blind, as you saw when I put up that picture of the storm, how terrible it was. Cameras weren't reliable in those days, but I took the best shot I could. And uh, he said, uh, we'll know when the other person's found something by two, tar two sharp, sorry, three sharp tugs on the rope. And that'll mean we found a tree or there's a problem. So Joel let Peter get a few steps ahead of him, and they both headed back in what they thought was the direction of the trees. They'd been wandering and blinded around like this for about 15 minutes when there were three sharp pulls on the rope. Joel felt those three sharp pulls, and he thought he heard a yell, hard to hear in the wind. And he could tell the other end of the rope was fixed, so Peter was still somewhere. So he started moving towards him. He followed the rope, and then he did hear a yell, and he could make out the word, help. That was definitely Peter, and he was nearby. Now he stopped and moved ahead very, very slowly. Remember, you can see nothing. He knew he was trapped somehow, because otherwise he would have been moving. So he was crouched as low as he could to the ground, moved ahead an inch or two at a time, and then he heard a splashing noise. I, he hollered, and he heard Peter from five feet away. Stop! You're at the edge of the pond. Well, it had been cold and had snowed, but it also had warmed up for a couple of days. And the ice wasn't as solid as it should have been. So they were on their second trip. That was at the end of the second trip. When he remembered the geography of it on their second trip back. That's where it was. And uh, the very heavy snow had left the ice very thin in the middle of the pond. So now they got a problem because not only they are in a blizzard, but his partner, Peter, Constable Peter Herman, is very wet, and he'll die of exposure quickly unless something is done. Well, the good thing was it was near that group of trees, so he pulled them out, and uh, they walked, made the way to the trees, and uh, they took his hatchet, they agreed for carrying a small hatchet, hacked off some branches, and made a lean-to shelter. And uh, <clears throat> the shelter would help, but it wouldn't be enough to keep Peter alive. Fortunately, they had matches in their emergency pack, and uh, one of the trees that had been dead for quite some time was ready, ready for burning. So they broke out some tiny pieces, made a fire, and got it going. So they got Peter as close to the fire as he could be, and they got the fire going and tried to get him dried off and tried to keep him alive. But it was a dire situation because that storm was roaring. It was roaring. And if I've got it right here, let's see. This is what it looked like. There. Can you see them? Oh, there are the trees. See the trees. But I can't see them. So the shelter is nearby. So still a heck of a storm going on. Well, <clears throat> they weren't going to be back to the house by the when the Conrad house when he told them they wouldn't be. Said, "We'll back to your farmhouse at a certain time." They weren't going to make it there, so I just hoped that somebody would miss them. But would it be in time? Well, hey, have I got something exciting to tell you? I hope you heard lightning at 200 Durham Street. Because if you did, then you'll know Joel you can contact an essence. And Joel isn't far from town, so of course he contacts Walter. He knew Walter couldn't physically help him, but he knew that maybe there was another way he could help. So he communicated with him and said, Walter, is there anyone else 
in town in Chasepert that has the ability to contact, you know, that you can contact, that they're a real person like me with my special ability, and they can get some help to us. Well, it turned out Walter knew something. And so he said, uh, yes, he said, I do know someone. He said, I don't know who she is, and I know she wants to remain anonymous, but if I think I send a message and tell her how urgent this is, and that Constable Herman may possibly die, I think she will help us. So Walter sent the message, told her where they were, and uh, let's see what happened. The message was that Constable Herman required medical attention, right? Now, this woman, her name, the first name is Gwen, she uh, would be asked to contact Georgie, and Georgie knew the whole story. She knew that Joel had these powers. And uh, so Georgie would contact Chief Petrovic and explain that Joel was supposed to call her from the police station at 5 to make arrangements for dinner at 6, and he hadn't called. Where on earth was he? Well, hey, that works out pretty good, doesn't it? The essence Walter contacts this woman, Gwen, who has the same powers as Joel does. Gwen walks around the corner or down the street for a couple of blocks and talks to Georgie and says, this is what's going on. And then Georgie says, great, I know what I do. I'll phone the chief. So she did. And that's what happened. So that meant that they just had to wait to see what would happen. And they waited, and they waited, and they waited. And then it was dark, and they could hear voices. So Joel started to shout, over here, over here. And then people heard him and shouted, we're on our way, we're on the way. And they could see, he could see the lanterns and hear people talking excitedly. And someone else hollered, watch out, because they'd reached the other side of the pond. And suddenly there was a group of men there. And the men had a stretcher. They could carry Herman, who had survived so far, back to the Conrad farmhouse. And so thanks to... Joel's special ability. Constable Herman lived. That was a terrible, terrible storm. and uh, But he survived it, and that's only because Joel had this special ability and was able to contact his friendly essence, Walter. There were no, were no missing body parts in this part of the story, but stay tuned because... There's lots more to tell you. Thank you for listening.